So with that, I'm going to go ahead and move forward here. Um, I thought I would present a little uh, overview of what we're going to look at here. So this first section um, intends to give you um, a pretty big picture of why we even have psychology. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, obviously, since um, time is limited and um, we really want to focus on holistic psychology, but I want to give you kind of a cultural background on why psychology even emerged as an active force, just briefly. Uh, so I'm going to touch on that and I'll explain the metaphors here in a minute. And then I want to give you four examples of holistic psychology. And holistic psychology is not, I should mention, a specific department or school. It's, it's actually more of a, a term for a, a variety of disciplines that share common values and practices. So after I, I do that, I want to talk about specific areas of inquiry that holistic psychologists look at. What are, what are the new things that are happening in the field? What are the current contemporary issues that, that we're working with? And then at the end, I'll just post something for more information, and then Ralph will be here to answer questions about the, um, the certificate itself. So that's where we're going to go. And so um, moving forward here, so the first section between cross and cogwheel. <laughs> um, I kind of look at psychology being born in between the two. And um, by cross, I don't mean just Christianity, but I also mean uh, organized religion. And um, it's, it's loosening of political power all across Europe at one point. Um, and then the rise of the world financial picture. And I put a renaissance in there because it's actually the, uh, in many ways, the money of the Medici that not only opened the first stock markets, but actually paid for the cultural advances of the Renaissance as we know it. So that was a factor. Um, the, obviously, the scientific and industrial revolutions. Most psychologists, at least in the States, consider themselves scientists, um, unless they're psychotherapists. Some of those do, too, actually. And then um, the whole deanimation of the sacred world. Young and other people have written about this extensively. Um, the loss of the sense of nature as being enfold and inspirited and speaking to us in the way that all of our ancestral um, connections would have talked about it at one time or another. So these are all factors that um, lead up to the rise of psychology itself culturally. And of course, the word psychology, uh, the etymology means science of soul. So as the sense of soul goes out of the, of, of the world of nature, in part due to uh, religious influences, in part due to the science and industrial revolution, it tends to show up inside the human psyche. And so we have the science of psychology. The word itself was coined, I think, in 1590 uh, by a man named Goclenius, um, and has been in use ever since then. So I'm painting that in a real broad brush. And um, I always like to pay um, a bit of respect to this person, Asara of Lucania. And uh, as we look now into the ancestry of psychology, and um, you don't um, you don't tend to hear about her in the psychology textbooks. Uh, you will hear about a few of the other folks I'm going to mention really briefly here. But she's remarkable for a couple of reasons um, that have directly to do not only with the rise of psychology, but the rise of holistic psychology. So no one is sure exactly when she lived, probably late 3rd century, early 4th century in, in Italy. And she wrote a book, which is probably the world's first book of psychology, called On Human Nature. And... And unfortunately, we don't have that book. We just have a couple of fragments. So um, I've told my students that if I ever obtain a time machine, one of the things I'm going to do is go back in the past and meet her and see if I can get a copy of that book um, and bring it forward. So if I ever show up with a copy of that book, you'll know I built the time machine. But um, the reason she's remarkable, and I just followed the natural what else she might have said, is uh, for her, the, the mind, the psyche, um, has to do with three active dimensions that are in continual interplay with each other, and she called them mind, spirit, and desire. And why this is important is, first of all, um, it influences Plato, and to some extent Aristotle. Plato talked about the soul being divided into three parts that work with each other. But even more, um, Asara's idea is that the psyche, so it's, it's, the psyche is a broader term than mind. You can think of it as... Um, Consciousness and unconsciousness all considered together. The psyche for her is an arena of interactive forces 
So it's very much what we would think of nowadays as a system. So not just a heap of stuff colliding with each other, but actually an intelligent, self-organizing system. And I mentioned Aristotle here because it's actually from him where we get that phrase that a system is greater than the sum of its parts. That's holism. So I want to mention um, Lao Tzu and his idea of the Tao, the Tao as a um, um, <laughs> how, to, how to describe the Tao in some words right? um, that which cannot be described, but being in alignment with the forces of nature as they manifest both inwardly and outwardly. That would be one way of thinking about the Tao. Um, and also, of course, the Buddha and his emphasis on mindfulness and also how the quality of our consciousness directly influences the quality of our lives and the decisions that we make. All of these could be considered early holistic psychologists. Also, I want to mention a couple of ancient institutions that tend not to show up in the psychology textbooks. Um, this is the Oracle at Delphi. Um, a source of wisdom for thousands of years so impressive that even um, Plato and Aristotle bowed their heads in recognition of the wisdom of the Oracle. There was a team of women who worked there, and the Oracle in charge was known as the pipe owners. And so if you if you had a burning question, a question about the direction that your life would take, or what should I do with my career, or how can I find the love that I want, or whatever it was, or maybe a political question, um, what decision do I make as a leader? You would go in person to Delphi, you would make pilgrimage there, and your question would be relayed to the Pythoness, and then she would go into an ecstatic trance. Um, we still don't know exactly how that worked, but we know that she had an altered consciousness, and she would speak directly out of that imaginal space and answer the questions. And this was an institution for thousands of years, and so this, this obviously has a very psychological influence that we can still feel today. I should mention also um, two other cultural currents, Gnosticism and alchemy. Gnosticism begins uh, probably shortly before the birth of Jesus. Uh, it's been around a long time, there, and there's both Christian and non-Christian Gnostic. And Gnostics, Gnosticism comes from a word, Gnosis, that was a, a word that was first um, used by very early uh, leaders in, in the beginnings of the Christian church to speak derisively about those folks in these weird spiritual study cir circles who say they know God. Um, they have direct access to the sacred. And so the word know comes to have this meaning of esoteric knowledge. So the Gnostics uh, were non-dogmatic group, small groups of people who probably um, came out of a number of different trends, uh, Jewish mysticism and the Hellenization of the ancient world. Um, cultural currents in Alexandria and a whole bunch of other things that all came together. And the basic idea was, as I mentioned, knowledge of the sacred through direct experience. Uh, so this obviously will, as we'll see, has, a, has an influence on transpersonal psychology in particular, which is one of the holistic psychologies. And then uh, Jung wrote, wrote extensively about alchemy, which, um, if you look it up in the dictionary, it would say the ancient attempt to turn um, lead or glass into gold or precious gems. Um, some of the more liberal-minded alchemists were involved in that, but alchemy actually not only lays the foundation for modern chemistry, which still uses some alchemical terms like hermetic seal, but alchemy was itself a loop of that. And Jung interpreted it as, um, after he went through uh, Probably the bulk of our chemical manuscripts that were still available in Europe when young was working went through all of them and found in them a whole psychological system. So that too is a forerunner um, of not only Jungian psychology but holistic psychology in general. And I should mention this institution, um, the, the House of Wisdom. Uh, you don't hear too much about this, um, and probably nothing in the psychology textbooks, but. Uh, the House of Wisdom, uh, you may have heard about the Alexandrian Library, which was a similar institution in Egypt. And um, for a, a good good period of time, the House of Wisdom gathered uh, particularly classical and scientific manuscripts from the ancient world and stored them. And so that resource was available when Europe went through the Dark Ages. And eventually a lot of those manuscripts were translated into Toledo and they began to filter through Europe shortly before the Renaissance. So a big part of the wisdom of the Renaissance, and therefore the whole modernist psychology and mindset and endeavor rests 
very strongly on the manuscripts that were collected at the House of Wisdom. So to be, um, to bring this up to a little bit further into our time, these are a couple of figures whose work has a direct bearing on the work that we do in holistic psychology. Even Arabi, um, a mystic who fortunately we do have access to a lot of his work. And I want to mention a, one particular term that he used a lot, which was imaginal, a term I used earlier. And it's different from imaginal. Imaginal uh, has to do with um, a whole realm, a whole internal realm. That um, if you thought about it in a spatial term, Henri Corbin, who is the scholar, one of the scholars who worked a lot on even Arabi's work, thought of it as somewhere between matter and spirit, or between thoughts and things, to put it in William James's terminology. Um, even Arabi talked about the Mundus of Matinalis, the imaginal world, and how the spiritual experience comes to us through image. So this was an enormous influence on young thought, and in fact, Young and Henri Corbin hung out a lot at conferences, one of which was called Erlo. So, um, I want to mention Gaston Bachelard, who also attended the image and wrote a number of marvelous books that we would now think of as phenomenology, the human experience, always staying very close to the stuff of experience itself, and very poetically written, too. And then Goethe, who, usually known as the playwright who wrote Faust, but also uh, an experimental scientist in many ways, and a father of phenomenology, especially in terms of actually looking at, he spent quite a lot of time doing this and documenting it actually, looking at plants that he was growing, and he was looking, as he put it in his writings and letters, for what he called the archetypal plant, um, the, the image behind all the growth and flourishing and death that he was seeing in the plants that he was working with. So this again, um, including the word archetype, is a huge influence on Young, and I'll say more about Young in a minute. So those are some of our ancestors, uh, direct founders, and I, I mention these folks for a particular reason, not just because they tend to show up in the textbooks on psychology, but they tend to be <coughs> um, they tend to be given a very specific spin. And here we begin to see why holistic psychology is different from the mainstream varieties that are more firmly wedded to not just empirical methods, but the empirical worldview, um, the, uh, a somewhat reductionistic materialistic worldview. Gustav Beckner is known as the founder of something called psychophysics. That's an early term for physiological psychology. He worked on stimulus threshold, sensory threshold. Um, that was his day job. Um, what got repressed, because it wasn't published until William James came along, was all his work on actual contact with nature. Um, Becker went through a long period of being blind, and when he opened his eyes again, was able to see. The first thing he saw was a flower blooming in front of him, and he instantly became a nature mystic. And he's written beautiful things about nature and the world and all kinds of other things that are just deeply moving to read, most of which have never been translated out of German. So right from the beginning, that you know, he being a founder not only of the scientific side of things, but also having that deeply felt connection to the natural world and to the sacredness of matter itself. Um, Franz Bretano was <clears throat> an early psychologist who um, was an inspirer of phenomenology. Um, if you've read any philosophy and you've heard of people like Husserl, you know, to the things themselves. In other words, focusing on description rather than explanation, focusing on the actual felt experience of things, of people, of relationships. That whole perspective finds a strong root in the, in the work of Bertano. Uh, and it's also a root in holistic psychology as well, very much focused on direct experience, not so much on explanation. So William James, of course, I have to mention, um, the first psychologist who really took spiritual experience seriously. His book, um, The Varieties of Religious Experience, has never been out of print. Um, and he was a huge influence on Young as well. And this man, Wilhelm Bott, uh, in the textbook say he was um, a founder of one of the early psychology laboratories, um, did something called the introspective method, which was studying uh, sensory states, um, states of subjectivity. But um, he also, like um, Asar of Lucania, had a very dynamic view of the human psyche. Um, was very, uh, very much a forerunner of Freud and Young in some ways, and, and a big influence on both of them in his writings. And he also talked about social psychology, <clears throat> which was a first in those days. 
Um, it wasn't just a focus on the individual, but Wilhelm von felt that there needed to be a whole branch of community psychology to, to study the mind of whole populations. So those are some of our ancestors. And um, let me just mention a few more here as we come through the historical arc. Jean A. Pierre Jean A. studied uh, hypnotic states. Um, his teacher was uh, Jean Martin Charcot in Paris. Uh, had a fully dynamic psychology of his own for which he was seldom given credit, um, this, even in courses on depth psychology. Uh, coined the word subconscious. He talked about how um, what one would call the complexes of the mind are autonomous sometimes. In other words, uh, there can be different sides of character running around in the mind that we don't necessarily know are there or that we're disturbed by when they surface in dreams as persons. Um, he studied that. He also studied how the stories we tell ourselves can influence our entire lives. He worked with clients who had gone through terrible personal losses and felt directly responsible for them. Um, one woman in particular. Um, so. This was an influence on Sigmund Freud. We've all heard of him and his, his doings. Um, he's often criticized for being a very materialistic, reductionistic psychologist, uh, reducing everything down to sex and death, basically. Uh, that's not quite fair to Freud, um, but there's definitely holistic aspect of his, his system of thought. Young we'll talk about more in a minute, but we've probably all heard about him, including his theory of archetypes which I'll touch on momentarily. And then Karen Horney, who was one of the founders of humanistic psychology, um, studied under Freud's system, uh, didn't think it was terribly fair to women, his theory of women's psychology, which upset him as, as it goes. Um, Karen Horney believed that a basic striving of human beings is what she called wholeheartedness. Very holistic idea. Wholeheartedness, the ability to do something with your entire mind and body and soul. And that was actually a therapeutic goal for her. And she influenced generations of animals with the way that she worked. She also is a holistic psychologist who wrote very clear books. And in fact, um, I have a special place in my heart for her because it was her book, Self Analysis, that actually started me being interested in psychology years and years ago. Um, very, very lucid writer and very, very, uh, insightful to. So I want to, um, uh, you know, going further into what makes holistic psychology different from the more mainstream varieties, especially in the States, um, I want to talk about some basic uh, operating um, attitudes or principles or premises behind these two different sorts of psychology. So um, if you think of mechanism not just as a machine like an iPhone, but mechanism as a way of thinking, mechanism as a worldview, as a way of seeing everything, the way Descartes did, René Descartes, the philosopher, everything is parts, everything is mechanical, right? So um, to this day, mainstream psychology tends to have mechanism at the heart of its worldview. And so um, some of the characteristics of this is reductionism, which means we take something very complex, like a state of consciousness, and we, we bring to it the assumption that by taking it apart or by reducing it to firing nerve cells, we can understand it. So it's reductionism is an attempt to understand a higher order reality by looking at its lower order parts, which is actually what philosophers call a category error. That, that's part of the mechanistic package. Atomism, um, looking at the elements, that term nothing but comes from William James. Uh, he was very critical of all this, and he actually left psychology when it went mainstream or when it was going mainstream because of this, a, a basic disagreement with this way of thinking. Um, there's an emphasis in mechanistic thought on hierarchy, top to bottom, uh, on linearity, this causes that, compartmentalizing, this, this part of the mind does something over here, that part of the body does something over there, thought comes from up here, other things go on down there. And then divisibility. So assuming that all these different elements are separate instead of assuming that they naturally work together. And also um, that meaning is something that human beings impose on the world rather than something that actually arises from the nature of life itself. So those are some assumptions, some characteristics of mechanism. Characteristics of holism are different from this. <clears throat> and 
and I like to think they're more comprehensive. So they don't necessarily throw out, this is a young phrase, of course, throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, mechanistic science has done wonders for us, but um, holistic ways of thinking try to be more inclusive. So um, here's the definition, a theory of the universe and living nature correctly seen in terms of interacting holes as of living organisms more than the sum of their parts. So qualities of holism include emergence. So the, these higher order properties like a state of consciousness, use my previous example, it emerges in a way that can't really be predicted from the lower levels. Uh, holarchy instead of hierarchy. So uh, a holon is a term that was coined by the philosopher Arthur Kessler and it means, it means a part, like an organ for instance, your heart is a holon, but it's a part that's also a whole that functions as a whole. So it's more like a nesting, so a cell in a heart, in the body, in a social system, in a neighborhood, in the world, rather than higher. It's less linear and more uh, holistic. Um, it's an emphasis on mutuality, that things interact with and constellate with each other instead of one, one simple thing pushing one other simple thing. And then integrality. So all of these different dimensions of experience being as important as each other, not reducing them all to the material, mind, body, soul, spirit, self, world, and heart, head, all of it working together. So going with this relationality, that we not we look not just at the elements of the systems we understand it, but we also look at how the elements interact with each other. More about that in, in a moment. And then meaning is not just a fact or a piece of data, but what does it mean? How does it actually affect how we live? Meaning in that sense, too. So some values of the, me the mechanistic way of thinking that mainstream psychology tends to use. Um, all of these, efficiency, order, conformity, literality, taking things literally, as opposed to metaphorically. Um, a lot of emphasis on predicting and control um, a lot of emphasis on certainty and uniformity. These are basic goals of a mechanical way of thinking. Whereas uh, in holistic thought, the values are more about fulfillment, harmony, creativity, imagination, so activation of the imaginal, uh, a fruitful ambiguity, in other words, an ability to sit with uncertain things and let meaning emerge spontaneously from whatever that mixture is. Self-organization, a system's ability to regulate itself instead of having to be controlled all the time. And then uh, an openness to experience and a friendliness to plurality, to many different meanings instead of narrowing everything down into one meaning or one interpretation. So uh, Virginia sat here with a family therapist, and she had a, a way of, I think, a useful way of thinking about this in terms of what she called the threat and reward model versus the seed model. It's two different views of human nature. The threat and reward model is more rooted in a mechanical way of thinking. The seed model is more rooted in a holistic way of thinking. And she noticed that this, this dichotomy tends to show up in lots of different human relationships. It can show up in workplaces. It can show up in how families operate, um, relationships, all kinds of things. So it's a useful blueprint for, for assessing things. Um, so the threat and reward model has to do with uh, a basic distrust of human nature, thinking that it's something that has to be controlled. Um, the motivation is very much taken care of. Um, autocratic rule, emphasis on control, um, goals external to the system, whatever it is, a family, a business, what have you, and a lot of emphasis on what's not allowed. By contrast, the seed and growth model more of a basic trust in human nature that if it's, uh, and this is a basic um, humanistic idea too, that under the proper circumstances, people will grow to their fullest possible potential if they're allowed to and encouraged to. Uh, that motivators are in, inside the person instead of always being imposed from outside. Uh, it looks at a more democratic way of organizing human relationships. Um, it's the seed and growth model is more interested in exploring where an impulse comes from and in controlling it. It sees the mind more as a kind of um, psychological democracy where everything should have a voice. Um, the goals tend to be internal and more relationally oriented. 
instead of imposed from outside. And there's more of an emphasis on guidelines on how to do things rather than strict rules and prohibitions. So with that background, I want to change gears here and move forward and actually give you four examples of holistic policies. So I'll mention the Jungian first. And um, Jung actually, uh, he was a pretty well-trained psychiatrist. He worked at a place called the uh, Berkholzer Institute in Switzerland. And then he had a vision on a train ride, actually, in 1913. Very disturbing vision for him. Um, he saw a Europe covered with uh, waves of flood water and then uh, that turned to blood. Just very disturbing, and he was worried about that. So he began to do a lot of self-analysis. But it wasn't an intellectual self-analysis. He began to go deeply into his fantasies. He began interacting with the imaginal characters who spoke to him in altered states of consciousness and also in his dreams. He kept a journal of the whole thing, which has now been published, it's called The Red Book, and uh, also did some artwork. So Jung, in good holistic fashion, was working not just with his mind, but with his heart, his emotions, and his artistic abilities, too. Uh, he also learned to sculpt a bit as well. Um, so there was an artistic dimension to what he did. For Jung, the psyche is self-organizing. It does that because it likes to experience itself as a whole. So when the psyche is fragmented, that's Jung's basic idea about what causes mental illness. That there's some aspect of the psyche that's being pushed out of awareness for whatever reason. <clears throat> Jung um, relied heavily on working with dreams, and um, active imagination was his term for his visionary experiment that he started in 1913. He would actually, um, and he taught people to do this, he would invite, let's say, a dream figure who would come up the night before into an imaginal conversation, so he'd go in kind of a gay dreamy state, and he'd say, what do you have for me? What, why are you addressing me? And then he would allow the conversation to unfold, and then he would learn things from those different sides of himself by doing this. Um, shadow is Jung's term for those aspects of ourselves that we don't like to look at and we tend to push out of awareness. And so for the mind to feel integrated as a whole, we have to welcome those back in somehow, even though we find them unpleasant. Um, myth for Jung <clears throat> is not an old explanation for weather or a word for something that's not true, there's a lot of psychological wisdom in myth. And so myths are actually a bit like, um, just as a dream reveals something about the backside of the mind to an individual, a myth portrays the underlying psychological operations of a culture. So myths, as a result, can be important. Um, through a culture's mythology, you can find out a lot about the culture and what it's going through. And then archetypes were, um, this comes down from Plato, but a lot of other people do. Uh, it's actually a, an idea that's quite widespread even outside the West. And uh, Jung felt that these psychological structures, so fantasies, um, active imagination, artwork, music, all kinds of things, always came down to some underlying images or patterns that are found all over the world. And what's useful about knowing this idea of archetypes um, and you can try this out, actually. So archetypes, just think of the big um, the big thematic things that you find all over the world. So death with a capital D, rebirth with a capital R, the hero, um, the hero's journey, the heroic journey is an archetype. Um, uh, initiation is an archetype, right? So, and also um, the divine marriage, whatever form that takes, the child, the mentor, um, the shadow is an archetype. Young noticed that archetypes tend to show up a lot when we're going through phases of transition in our lives, developmental milestones. So if you're in a period of your life ever, or you have been in the past, and things suddenly seem very mythical, it's almost like you're in a fairy tale, and they might seem kind of strange, and you notice these big themes coming up, um, heroes and monsters and whatever form that makes, you know, monster is a metaphor. Um, all these different fantastic things began springing up out of the pavement, then um, Jung would say you're probably in a transitional place. And these folks are both ha helpers and hinderers to see you on the road. So something to look back through your life and see if that's the case, or perhaps it is for you right now. Um, they, they can be signals for how to negotiate this labyrinth. 
Um, synchronicity is young, young sperm or coincidences that happen that they seem meaningfully connected. So um, I have a, a fresh example of one of these right off the press. I teach a class called Archetypal Mythology at CIIS. And uh, I was getting the, um, the video set up yesterday. <clears throat> and so um, I had a particular slide that was displayed and um, wasn't keeping track of when the screen table was ready. So um, I was talking about Trickster which is an archetype. And trickster figures are all over the place, you know, comedians and um, they're, the, they're the chaos causers, the disruptors, the outlaws, um, the John Stewart's, um, the, the, the Stephen Colbert's, you know, they're, they cause chaos but in service to exposing the truth in a greater home down the road. Um, they're useful, we need the trickster dimension to remind us to play, you know. So right when I was talking about at the very instant I talked about how trickster does unexpected things, the slide changed, and my whole face and body went blue. <laughs> and the whole I had about 22 students in the class, they all laughed, right? And I said, like that. <laughs> so that would be an example of the synchronicity. I didn't cause that, and it didn't cause my, my little um, uh, lecture on the trickster, but they surfaced together in a meaningful fashion. So that's something else to keep an eye out for. <clears throat> that somehow when, you, when you're when you up against an internal decision or wondering about a, um, where to go next in your life, it doesn't just happen inside. It doesn't just happen internally or in green. It happens outside too. So those moments of alignment are what Jung considered guideposts for making decisions. And then Jung's basic goal, individuation, becoming an individual, um, today we would call it self-realization. Um, the unfolding of your genuine nature, um, the, the discovery of who you really are, which is no easy thing to do. Um, the, and the individuation can happen on an unconscious level, but um, the way Young usually speaks about it is when we actually go to a great deal of trouble to find out what is it that I really want, for instance. I know what I should want. Um, we all know what we should want, but what is it that I actually want? That can be a really hard question for some people to answer, even in very specific situations. Um, when I worked as a therapist, sometimes I would ask a client, what do you really want in a relationship? They would say, I never really thought about it. Or what, do you, what kind of job do you really want? Or what do you want to be in 20 years? And not sh should, but want. You know? um, so the surfacing of desires and impulses and promptings um, Herman has to talk about the promptings that come from my true self. Working with all those can get one on the path of individuation according to the way Young holds all this holistically. And then a, a little quotation by him. My life is a story of the self-realization of the unconscious. Everything in the unconscious seeks outward manifestation and the personality too desires to evolve out of its unconscious conditions and experience itself as a whole. It's from uh, Young's Seminal All of All with the Memory Dreams Reflections. So another branch of holistic psychology that came after Young and was directly inspired by him, um, humanistic and existential psychology. <clears throat> so what Young calls um, individuation, um, this branch of psychology tends to talk about as self-realization or self-actualization. And it says that it's built into us, that it's a natural part of who we are. Uh, it's not just that we want to do things in order to fit in or to get paid or whatever it is, although those are all nice things to do, but that there's actually a forward-moving tendency in a specific direction. And so to access that, what we need is um, openness to all our experience. In the, in the basic humanistic and existential model of health, it's the places where we filter out our experience, where we repress our experience that make us less than who we could be. Uh, Carl Rogers talked about three conditions that allow this unleashing of potential in people. Uh, the first one, and these are conditions that can happen in therapy and by the therapist, but they're also things that can happen outwardly. Supportive friendships, um, good relationships all do some aspect of these. And so the three conditions, um, one is congruence or being real with people. So a therapist, <clears throat> being genuine with a client instead of hiding behind a professional facade would be an example of, of congruence according to Carl Rogers. 
Um, he talked about the need for empathy, accurate empathy, and it doesn't mean parroting back what a person is saying. Um, it's irritating when you say something um, very emotional to a person and they go, I hear you, or I see what you know where you're coming from or whatever. Rogers wouldn't do that, and if you see him in videos, he doesn't work like that. He, he gets down into the specific feelings that people are actually experiencing. He might say something like, I hear the anger in that, but there might be a little sadness too. What do you think? So he goes a little bit below the surface to help people open up their experience. And the third condition is unconditional positive. We've all, we've all heard of prizing someone as a person, even though it's just their behavior. If those three conditions are present, according to Rogers, human beings will flourish. And that was part of the reason he had a base of trust in human nature. Um, on the existential side of all this, our decisions make us. The person who is going in one direction as a result of the decision is different from the person who goes in another direction as a result of the decision. So it's actually the choices that we make and refuse to make every day mm -hmm. that determine who we are, more than outside forces. Uh, Martin Buber's terms come to mind here. He talked about having with other people an I, thou, direct, uh, concrete, um, experiential relationship rather than seeing people as an it, as, as something to label and something to affect upon, um, which tends to kill a relationship. Rogers often said the facts are friendly. He actually did a lot of scientific work um, with therapy clients. He was the first therapist to video record sessions with new therapists, by the way, so that they could learn from their mistakes as well as their, their strengths. Um, and then Rogers talked a lot about, and another humanistic psychologist too, about the wisdom of one entire organ. So there's a very holistic theme there too. Um, that the wisdom of the body, what is my conscious say, what do my dreams say? Um, are my feelings aligned with how I think of this situation? <clears throat> and the goal for Rogers is to be a full human being. <laughs> that most of us actually are not. Most of us are partially grown up, or partially aware, or partially awake. But to be as, as fully awakened as we can be. Uh, those are Abraham Maslow, all actualizers, people who come home to themselves and each other. And then a, a quotation here by Carl Rogers. This process of the good life is not, I am convinced, a life for the faint-hearted. It involves the stretching and, and growing of becoming more and more of potentialities. It involves the courage to be. It means launching oneself fully into the experience of life. Transpersonal psychology. Um, the, the term, um, or I should say the discipline comes out of uh, humanistic psychology. Um, it has to do with um, you could, you, well, you could actually translate transpersonal psychology as spiritual psychology. So it's psychology that takes spiritual experience at its, at its value. It actually studies it, charts it, takes it seriously, sits with it. Um, transpersonal doesn't mean uh, away from the personal. It doesn't mean different from the personal level of experience, but it does include beyond. So it's a wider sense of identity. Um, and it asks questions like, what makes all extraordinary? Um, and it also looks at extraordinary states of human consciousness. Um, Maslow referred to peak experience as times in your life where you feel fully alive. It may be in the this personal psychology focuses on what makes those states happen and how we chart them and what can we learn from them and what are the palettes about the human experience. Why, Maslow often said, why do we just look at conflicted people? Why do we just look at pathology? Why can't we look at greatness? Joy and other things, beauty. Um, it, it has always has had a strong emphasis on research and exploring these. Um, they're called states and stages um, as you go through. Sometimes states of transpersonal ecstasy, for, for example, can turn into longer term stages where you kind of live in that place. So, how does that happen and what's the research on that? Um, looking at spirituality, not so much as a system of rules or dogmas but more as based in our direct experience of the sacred, however that comes across. Uh, spiritual dreams would be an example of that. Peak experiences too. Uh, there's a whole group of, um, I hate to use the word syndromes, because holistic psychology tends not to use the medical model of understanding things, at least in terms of its basic descriptions of experience. 
But um, spiritual emergence has to do with um, a budding sense of spirituality that actually can be alarming and unpleasant and, and scary. And so uh, if you ever read through um, the mystics of different religions, and I'm thinking of, for instance, on the Christian side, St. John of the Cross, you, you see in their writings that spiritual experiences are not always pleasant. They can be times of immense darkness or incredible feelings of energy that one can fall out of pain. And so there's some writing available by Stan and Christina Groff, who are two transpersonal psychologists, about this. And the, their book is actually called Spiritual Emergency, What Happens and How to Deal with It. Something that's very neglected in, in mainstream therapy. And then um, a lot of emphasis in transpersonal psych on a dialogue between the Eastern spiritual and wisdom traditions and the Western forms of psychology to see where they can inform each other. So a basic goal for this branch is an expanded range of identity, an expanded sense of human possibility beyond the norm. <clears throat> Abraham Maslow used to talk about um, what he called the pathology of normalcy. Um, so how can we move beyond that to a more fulfilling place. And a quote from Francis Vaughn, one of the, one of the uh, founders of Transpersonal Sight. I think of the spiritual path as a journey from fear to love, from bondage to freedom and from ignorance to understanding. I value integrity, honesty, and authenticity in relationship. And I think we need to be true for our deepest experience of the sacred. That very well captures the flavor of the kind of personal work. And so lastly, I wanted to mention um, two things. Eco-psychology is the applied form, which is eco-therapy. And so um, eco-psychology was a term that was coined in 1992 by uh, Ted Rozak. He wrote a book called Voice of the Earth. And he raised the question, uh, how can we possibly feel that we, can, that we can be fully awake and healthy and self-realized when our planet is in ecological decline, or in when specific areas of our planet are in decline. And so a basic premise of eco-psychology is that planetary health and personal health arise and diminish together, that we simply can't break that connection. And that a part of our uh, collective suffering involves thinking that that connection is there. Um, in other words, believing that we can actually master nature, for instance, or believing that we can actually live fully apart from the natural world, even though we evolved in it, and even though we continue to be dependent on it for every breath that we take. So eco-psychologists say, well, if this is true physically, you know, we need to eat, we need to sleep, and our bodies are part of the What does that look like psychologically? To actually have a good relationship with them. Um, so there's in that denial of the, the connection to the earth, um, that for eco psychologists is a source of pathology, a source of illness, but it's the connection is usually not made consciously. So um, if you ever go through a period of time where you haven't been outside in a while, um, let's say for a few days or even a week, it, 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 we all have varying sensitivities to that, but and you start feeling a bit down, or you start getting anxious, um, stroll through a garden, or just some little piece of greenery that's nearby, and see if it actually raises your spirit. If it does, it may indicate that you're actually not getting enough with the nature connection that you really need in order to be fully up and running. Um, ecotherapy emphasizes methods for doing that, so how to reconnect with plants and animals, uh, basically by being around them and having interactions with them and noticing them and feeling and smelling and tasting and um, gardens are a great source of it. <clears throat> you know, if you start, I found this out by being a permaculture and master gardener. If you if you make a garden somewhere, you're making community and all kinds of people show up who ordinarily you wouldn't have met any other way. It's fantastic. Um, there's tons of research about how being in a garden is healthy for you psychologically and physically. Uh, being in, in even a little bit of nature. You can do this in the city. <clears throat> we have to get get beyond that city-country dichotomy where we think that um, we're going to go out in nature somewhere and have the great you know, outdoors experience, and it's unavailable in the city. We can bring nature into the city, and it's already there in a lot of ways. I mean, you can look out and see the sky. You know, I mean, it's, it's as close as that, or even a little bit of greenery. Um, to show you how powerful this is, <clears throat> there are studies that... When you're recovering from surgery, 
you will recover faster and uh, easier if you even have a view of the natural world. Uh, it's, it takes that little, um, and there's a lot of research on this. So um, interspecies communication is part of this because we're starting to learn as we, as we collectively shift from the mechanistic ways of thinking about things to a more holistic way, a more participatory, interactive way of looking at reality. Because we're shifting that way, we're beginning to see that animals are more intelligent than we thought that they were. And so we're beginning to actually understand what they're telling us. So there's been, over the last 10 years, all kinds of exciting research into this field. So for instance, um, apes are being taught sign language, and they're actually making sentences when they speak to us. Um, all kinds of things. We're looking into dolphin communication. Um, that's a favorite of a lot of humans. Dolphins have actually been helping us fish for probably centuries. Um, out here in California, there's uh, we have a lot of crows out here that um, they like to grab onto acorns and then they fly over a piece of pavement and they drop drop it down to break it and then they fly down and they grab the meat of the acorn. But they know that the traffic in California is pretty bad. <laughs> uh, well, cities all over the place, right? So um, they wait for the lights to change, and they drop it into an intersection. And so when the humans are walking across, the crows know that's the time to go and grab it. So they do that. Um, we know elephants show up one year after the death of somebody in their tribe, and they do a circle, and they lower their ears and their tail, and then walk. And animal researchers think they're this is deliberate mourning for a lost loved one. <clears throat> so all kinds of exciting things coming out of that and the value for us um, is that we get to feel like we're part of an intelligent world and we're all above all of it and we're not alone in all of it that we're actually in intimate contact with all kinds of things living things uh, so that, i'm going to stop with that this part with that question how to bring more nature into the city <clears throat> that's something we're looking at out here in san francisco too i work in a very urban part of the city um, at CIS, and so we're always looking at ways to get potted plants in. We have a beehive up on the roof now, making honey for us, things like that. And so the basic goal of eco-psychology and eco-therapy is connecting personal and planetary health and cultural transformation that comes about as a result of that. Cultural transformation being how can our education systems, how can therapy, how can our workplaces benefit from having a different relationship to the natural world. So here's a quote from one of the founders, Mary Bell. Eco-psychology examines the psychological processes that bond us to the natural world or that alienate us from it. Eco-psychology is essentially about becoming cultural beings. So in this last section, I'm going to, um, I've been narrowing the focus as we go, so I'm going to focus on specific issues that holistic psychology deals with. This is just a handful. There's many more I could have included, but I just wanted to give you a taste of what, we're, what we've been doing. <clears throat> so all kinds of things coming out more um, If you go online for even five minutes, you can get, immediately dig up all kinds of research about how meditation actually builds brain structure. Um, we've got graduate students now at CIS who are doing dissertation work on this, and um, there's one person I'm thinking of who um, is teaching brief meditation to corporate executives. And it turns out that um, there's benefits even to brief meditations. You don't have to do it for hours. Um, and a lot of people at first think they're too busy to do it for, for a very long time. Of course, once they get hooked on it, even like five-minute meditations, even 30-second meditations, and they begin to have more focus and they feel better, uh, brain tissue changes, then they oftentimes they turn around and say, oh, what's the 15-minute one look like? <laughs> or what's the hour one look like? So it's... Um, seducing people into um, uh, a more focused kind of consciousness that actually has beneficial effects on the brain and helps people live longer too. Um, neuroplasticity is a term that refers to how experience changes brain structure. Um, so it's not, we used to, the old mechanistic way of looking at it is that my brain and what's in it determine how I see reality and what I do and what I think. We now know it's much more interactive than that. <clears throat> that changing your consciousness, changing your surroundings, changing your relationships actually modifies your brain uh, in either harmful or beneficial ways, depending on what you want to do. Um, we're, we have a research coming in on the neural basis 
spiritual experience. Um, to mention a brief piece of it, uh, there's a part of the brain that actually deals with our sense of time. It's like a timekeeper in the brain. It's a neurological correlate of time. When people are in very deep states of meditation, that area of the brain gets very quiet. So the neurological basis of linear time quiets down in deep meditation. Many different things coming out of this research. The neural basis of dreaming, we've been studying that for a while. And also um, feedback so systems that are so good that you've actually influenced single nerve cells in your brain. Amazing stuff, just amazing. And then um, if you look at that uh, picture I've included here, <coughs> where it's the brain stem, is a stem, it's like a trunk and it branches outward. It makes the archetypal pattern of the tree. And this is a very common pattern in the natural world. Um, part of my work involves looking for archetypes in nature. So it makes me wonder if our brain is a tree in a way. It's the structure is very similar in some way. Um, and what does that mean for all the tree imagery and myth and religion and our affinity for tree and trees and even our English word truth etymologically is related to the word tree. So maybe something there to look at. Trees of life in many different mythologies. Um, we're looking at how healing can take place across generations. <clears throat> the, the mechanistic view used to be that your genes dominate your life. Um, I think of this as genotheism. <laughs> genotheism, your genes dominate your life. We now know that there's a whole chemical control center in the body that determines which genes are on and which are off. And it's you can see it in twins. I have twin nephews. And, they look different now, they're in college, and they don't, they don't look identical anymore. Um, they, part of the reason is that their experiences have changed as they've spent more and more time apart, but part of it is that they have a different epigenome. So we now know that there, this chemical layer intercedes between the outer world of relationships and the inner world of the genes. So the epigenome passes down things that are not passed down in the DNA. Here's an example. If you are the descendant of a group of people who were massively displaced through, let's say, warfare or pushed out of their country somewhere or whatever, then you're actually at higher risk for an anxiety disorder, epigenetically, and it's not in your DNA. So this is we're just beginning to understand how this works. You can think of it as the, the enzymatic, the chemical basis of all that ancestral knowledge that people have been giving us down the years through different exercises and ceremonies and telling us, especially from other cultures, it's really important to think about your ancestors and include them in your life and all that. You know, we're now starting to see some scientific basis for this. It sometimes takes science a while to catch up with the sign that's already out there. Um, we're looking, especially in terms of family therapy, we're looking at um, emotional conflicts that go down through generations and families. It'd be really interesting to do not only a family tree, <clears throat> but to do a family mental health tree. Um, genograms is what they're called. Uh, therapists do, and family therapists do them very often. Um, I've done a lot of ancestral work with my family. I'm adopted, and so I was really interested from, which not a lot of adoptees are, but I was really interested in where I came from and what my roots were. And I was, because of my therapy training, I was able to see some of the um, inner conflicts and relational conflicts that get passed down on both sides of my family, adopted and birth. It's been fascinating to compare to and to see where they're different and where they're similar. Um, I mentioned ancestral exploration. We have classes in the school where we talk about how to talk to the ancestors in the, in the imagination and um, see if they pop up in our dreams, all, all kinds of fascinating layers to this. I mentioned family systems and um, also some of these conflicts that get handed down through families. Young taught us that con inner conflict often has a, sim a symbolic value of some kind. So as an example, um, there's a pattern in my birth family of, um, well, how can I put this? Um, there, there's a pattern on my birth father's side of the family of standing up to irrational authority figures. It's very consistent. It goes on generation after generation. But the interesting thing is it takes different forms. So um, my great, 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 ninth great grandfather was James Pylon, and he was um, in the Virginia colony in the 1600s. And 
he um, got kicked out of what, what was called the House of Burgesses, the local legislature in Virginia, because he disagreed with the majority. Um, that's very typical of that, of that part of my family. It, it's, um, when I told my birth father when I met him some of my own struggles with that when I was younger, he'd go, oh, well, you know, it runs in the family, and then he told me about from the hood. They look different. The circumstances are different. But they, they all stick to the motif of standing up to a rational authority. So it can be fascinating to look through your, what you can access of your family history and, and look for those images and themes that keep resonating down the generations. Incredible stuff. So um, another issue that's coming up for holistic psychology is how to awaken the senses. <clears throat> in the West, and particularly in the U.S., we tend to drive our bodies like cars, you know. And so um, Jorge Ferreira yeah, yeah, coined the term bodyfulness because he felt that mindfulness sometimes, although it's really great training, is a little too much mind and a little long enough body. So accessing the wisdom of the gut um, as a little memory aid and, and something to tell people just to impress them maybe. There's actually um, enough neur neurons in your gut to make the brain of a cat. And cats are pretty smart, so you've got cat wisdom in your belly if you choose to access it. Um, the awakening the senses include different exercises for coming alive to your senses. Um, sometimes when we work outside, <clears throat> we actually lead people through gardens on a smell zone. So we have them smell everything that they come across, and then we ask them, what does this bring up for you? Memories, feeling... What is it? What, what's happening for you? And it, it's amazing. There was a study last week that shows that, I, I forget the number, but it's more than all smells that the human nose can detect. Incredible. Just the nose. Um, a lot of trauma, body, body workers will tell you that, the, that our, the cells of our body hold a lot of trauma that we haven't resolved. And so sometimes talking about the trauma is not enough. We actually have to release it through different kinds of body work. <clears throat> because the body, too, is an aspect of nature. Um, the body is also nature's emissary. So the state of the body in some ways is also the state of nature and how it feels. So much to I could talk about. Um, energetics, uh, the vital body that people work with. Um, you'll be hearing about this through some of the, the other presenters that come through the certificate. Um, and also the body is a safe place to go when you're not feeling safe or when you're really stressed out and how, how, how to make that work. Um, and then uh, I want to mention a little bit more about nature. Um, there's a term, terra psychology, that we've been using for a while, and we look at how um, the things around us actually act as an extension of our mind. So here's a, here's a quick example. Um, it, it can be entertaining and useful to look at your apartment or your cottage or your house, wherever it is that you live, as a kind of map of your unconscious. So you could do a walkthrough and say, okay, so my living room, that's where, that's maybe the social part of me. That's, that's where everybody hangs out. So what's actually in my living room? And what shape is it in? You know, is my living room a place where people feel welcome? Um, is it a place where people uh, like to interact? Or is it more closed off than that? What's in the back? You know, what's, what's the back part of, in other words, the back of the psyche? What's the back part of my home? And what's, what things do I actually have out there? One can interpret those things like dream symbols. So try that sometime and see what happens. It's interesting to notice what's in these places. What's in the basement? What's in the attic? You know? What's out of view? Right? <clears throat> um, Annabelle, when she comes to New York City, will be talking about how cities definitely act like gigantic organisms, gigantic psychic organisms. Um, where does the city keep its conscience? Where does the city keep its senses? Um, where's the thought basis of the city and all that. Look at a map of Paris sometime. <clears throat> this works in New York City too, by the way. Look at a map of Paris. It's divided by the Seine River. And the left bank of Paris is so culturally different from the right bank of Paris that it's like two hemispheres of the brain. So once you do that, they got a map of New York City and start looking at it from a psychological perspective and see, see what you see. What, and you know, questions like, why are we drawn to certain places? Some places we just feel very much at home at, and other places it just never works until we leave, right? <laughs> um, how can we actually feel at home where we live? Because most of us don't, especially those of us who, like me, have had to move along. Um, 
And how big, so here's the big question, how might Earth itself be conscious? How might the Earth itself be a sentient organism? And, and does it have a language, symbolic language that maybe we can understand? Who knows? And then I'll be talking a bit about um, the way myths, the way these old stories reinvent themselves and come back to life in the present, because myths are not just dead old stories. They're happening all over the place. <clears throat> Joseph Campbell said, there's a myth happening down, down right down here on the corner. Beauty and the Beast or whoever mythic, mythic characters are waiting for the red light to change the green. You know? So how do these old stories keep coming up? How can we interpret them when they do? My, the class I teach, I we do the myth news every week. So um, I have them bring in, anytime there's a bit of mythology happening in the world, um, they can't always identify what the exact myths or the mythic figures are, but they're well enough along in the class now where they have a sense of when there's a myth going on. And then they bring it in and we talk about it as a group. It's great. Young thought, <clears throat> we actually have a personal myth. So just as we have a spiritual self and a physical self and a mental self and all that, young thought, we were actually born into a mythic story. So I'm going to be um, doing some work with you around that. It's, um, I've been working on this for a while with a lot of people. It's amazing what comes out of just a birth story. Um, because in, in decades of collecting information about this, I've learned that nobody's birth story is normal. Nobody's, right? Most people think that it is. So they'll, people will say, I was born at 5 o'clock in the morning on this day and at this time, and it was complete ordinary delivery, it was ordinary labor and all that. And I tell them, dig deeper. Talk to people about your birth, yet maybe have siblings or parents or whoever. Look at old records, because you haven't found it yet, right? And then, sure enough, they'll go, oh, and the cab broke down on the way to the, you know, or I was put in the custody of the wrong set of parents or some something. It might be a little thing or it might be a huge thing, but there's always some twist to a person's birth story, and that twist is where the myth is. So we'll be working on that. More on that to come. And then a, another big question. So where are the gods today? Where are the ruling principles? Uh, where are the sources of the sacred and what's happening? To and for that matter, is it possible to bring the gods back to life? Is it possible to rejuvenate the sacred and give it new containers of being? So we'll look at that too. And then um, sometime when you get a chance, look up. Earthrise online. Um, most of you probably know what it is already. That picture that was taken of the Earth rising above the moon in 1968 um, on the night before Christmas, actually. And um, Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, thought that Earthrise is not just a picture of Earth that looks pretty, but that the reason it coincides with all these environmental things happening and all this consciousness of the Earth and all the rest of it is that it's actually a big mythic image that shines over a whole era. So we're gonna explore that a little bit and, and probably in my last presentation there under the certificate, see what's, what's up with that. So um, the last slide I have for you, can we folks, how do I find out about more of this? Work more deeply with people, what's available in terms of the tools that holistic psychology offers. So um, have a look at the Journal of Holistic Psychology, they're really easy to find online. Um, some really good writing in there. Um, Open Center, obviously, and uh, my school, my um, CIS, those are three good places to start uh, building your knowledge of holistic psychology. So I think at that point, I'm done with what I wanted to present. Thank you.